Okay, we're at a police slash military base here in the Nile Delta. And this place is very surreal. We've been going through incredible agricultural areas, and now this whole ancient archaeological site has basically almost nothing growing on it. Just one remains in any other side. So we're several hundred miles away from any granite or quartzite stone quarry, and yet look at the number and size of these huge blocks here. So, Patricia, was all this stuff found buried? Yep. Absolutely. They've moved it, lined it all up here. And you can look out here and you'll look and look at how the desert moves and all these lumps. Everything under there, this site is covered. We're probably only seeing 2%, if that, of what's underneath the sands. And as you walk around, you're going to see how amazing. You're going to see the obelisks that they tried to take away. And because they didn't understand the physics of it, they're broken in two all over the place. Um, over here is the sacred lake, and it's built and constructed, and there's even, as you go down the steps, you can see there's writings along the bottom. But this whole site, half, most of it's underground, but what we're seeing is unbelievable. Um, uh, when I've been reading uh, Petrie's original uh, text, he said that there was roughly a 120-foot colossi here. Uh -huh. One colossi, but he speculates that there should have been two, but they've only found the one. Uh -huh. But he said it was all into pieces. And from Ramses the second time, they have been carving things out of these pieces, but said there was enough pieces that he could fit it together to a minimum of 120 feet high. And it would have been a, a granitic right. stone. That He said it was a granitic as opposed to being the quartzite like these ones. Any estimate on the weight? Well, he equated it with the um, Ramesseum. So a Big. 700 to 1,000 yes. tons moved either from the eastern desert or from... As one quarry. That's right. Which is at the opposite end of Egypt. That's right. But the damage is much more on the right side than the left side. Wow. Why is it cut like that? Because the statue itself was broken apart and this was used as a block in modern structures like this. Wow. But when you look at a statue that is this big and you look at the size of the foot and then look at the size of a foot like this size, then how the... 125 how feet tall. These have a really fairly, they have a reasonable quartz content in them. Uh -huh. So I'm not sure where they come from. It's either going to be in Sinai or the eastern desert, but they have quite a bit of quartz in them. So they are, look at how coarse and loose that is. Yeah. They're going to break apart a lot quicker than some of the darker ones. And we can see that it's not as perfect as the structures in the pyramid structure. There is huge space between the Doing dynamic video here, folks. One solid piece of granite. So 
So this is dynastic work or later. You can say it, see it's limestone, small pieces. And then we have this landscape here. Solid chunks of granite either from the eastern desert or Aswan in this absolute south of Egypt. And obelisks whose surface here is exceedingly heavily eroded. Lots of obelisks. But also it has another good evidence to it that we can see. Look at the amount of flints in it. I think perhaps that these came first because they've got the better cuts that have been preserved. Uh -huh. And I think it's because they're finer crystalline size and the lattice structure holds together. So when they cut it with precision, it holds that precise angle and the smoother cut on it. That's why stuff is even worse. Right. But this is not like Well, this is travertine, and you th you think that it's possible that the travertine isn't even from Egypt? Well, from what I've seen of the hot springs around here, they are fairly small hot springs. This could be from uh, one of the smaller hot springs because you can see the crystal size. Whereas, remember in the uh, in the in Karnak, we were seeing those calcite crystals about this thick before they hit the mudstone. That thick again, mudstone. These are very small. I think this may be a, maybe local or maybe just on the edge of one. Okay. Well, see, there was a piece at the other place that. So Susan, here's an interesting piece of stone or something. It's got gas bubbles in it. I think it's a piece of uh, slag from, I've read the Romans used to work glass here, but it may have been something else that they were working, but that appears to be a piece of slag. Okay, but could it be a piece of cooked stone? No. No? When you feel it, it's just way lighter. It's it's from the, the smelting process. Oh, yeah, there's way too much destruction and surface damage here. Possible evidence of the stone being scorched. Cool. 
very cool. So you see the limestone and that tells us this is likely dynastic period. However, you have these massive slabs of granite. And not just massive uh, slabs of granite, this is actually a room or series of rooms which are now underground but could have been above ground thousands upon thousands of years ago. Solid granite room leading on to another room. Oh, that's a box. Good, very good. This uh, will close uh, with the lid on it. So, an underground structure with giant slabs of granite. And I don't know what that is, whether it might be a box. So this site is called Tanis. It's located about four miles, sorry, hours north of Cairo. Uh, phenomenal site, megalithic, seems to have been buried uh, as a result of a cataclysm. It was likely dug up during dynastic times by Ramses II in order to utilize the granite for other construction purposes. And then the famous French archaeologist Mariette did some work here and others. About an hour, I'll have my ready. Harder! So they say because this is impossible and they realize that this is impossible, they said they made a line of mud gray, a two hole, an empty space between it, not the edge.
Okay, Peter, you're an engineer. What can you comment about the plausibility that this work was done with stone hammers? And the main question I have is, how do you think they were going to attempt to get this out of the pit that it's in? Well, I think first of all, doing it with stone probably wouldn't have worked. Probably taken too much time to do it and you won't get this kind of alignment. I mean, this is pretty big. And then there's another question of the, the spacing just between the rock and the bedrock. How would you fit people in there? For how long? And then to get it out, I mean, you need a structure on top of these rocks, which just, you know, it's impossible to set up. Even if you set it up, you need to probably move it at one point in time. And why do it in the end? I mean, that's, that's one of the main questions. I mean, if you if you can just take smaller pieces of rock, just put them all together, you could just do that. But they preferred to take this huge piece of rock out of the out of the ground. The question is why. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is what looks like another unfinished obelisk behind a large one, only shown to me in 2009 by someone who was local. And it's also very indistinct from the outside. It's not till you come down here that you see they were undercutting, scooping out just like they did the big one. And to his credit, Brian Foster in 2015 saw the crack there and said, Stephen, this is why they stopped this one. Exactly right. Same thing. They got to this point undercutting, and they didn't even bother. And there you can see they were being shaped with an obelisk. And they stopped. Yeah. Yeah. We got Chris down here in 2013 and he was video. It was great. There's nothing else here. Thank you, lady. Once they saw we started to come here, oh, then they're going to take interest about what we're doing. So these rocks were put down from 2013. We came back 2015. This was here. Reminds me of the crates. I'm, const I'm constantly quoting you, my master. So we go both ways, my friend. That's right. When it comes to quoting the Inca, I talk to you about you. You are the authority. And pre-Inca. Okay. Okay. 
Nacionales.